driving around, we had a, a drink stop and we had a buffalo on the other side of the fence in another reserve. He kind of sat there and looked at us and looked at the fence and looked at us and he was quite chilled out so we had a drink there while, because um, he actually came out to see us, we didn't realise he was there. Um, but I must admit I was quite glad of the fence being there. So he was quite relaxed and he obviously felt the same. And we started driving up around the airstrip and we came around the corner and I just suddenly see this, because obviously it's quite dark at this point, and I suddenly see a tail. Now my first thought was a serval. And I thought, oh, wonderful, a serval. I haven't seen one for a while. And then I suddenly realised, hold on a minute, this body is a lot bigger for a serval. And it actually turned out to be this, this female leopard. And she, she actually hid behind a bush. She wasn't too sure about us. And when we switched off the vehicle and I dropped the spotlight so that it wasn't shining directly on her, uh, she eventually came out from behind the bush, sort of stood there and looked at us, and she she kind of decided, okay, well, we we're not that threatening, and she kind of skulked off, and uh, that was probably about uh, four or five meters away, and obviously to my friends, they they'd never seen a leopard there, so that really made their their weekend stay as well. So that was really awesome um, to actually to see another leopard in a different area. Um, that really was. It's just been such a great leave, I must have been. Had a, a great relaxing time as well. And uh, even visiting my friends in Enterbeni and catching up with them. And uh, as I say, I've driven the, the country quite a bit. And I've now sort of been on the, the eastern side because the western side I've been to, and that's the Karoo. And it, it's quite a vast open space. Um, you just, I can only imagine maybe... Um, like the uh, Nevada desert or something like that. It's, it's just very, very vast open space and very few plants unless you go at the right time of year. And when it flowers in the Karoo, apparently you can get all types of, of flowers and there may be different species of flowers the following year. So if you think that you've got uh, pinks and yellows one year, you might, depending on the rainfall, you might have um, whites and reds the next year. It, it's, it's quite variable in that area, and that's to, down towards the western side of South Africa. Um, so having a very, very different um, zones, if you like, of, of South Africa, and actually being able to drive through them, you, you really get a, a feel for them. And that's definitely what I've been trying to do. Um, there's still parts that I still would like to go to. I'd like to go further into the Drakensberg um, and actually go towards maybe Lesotho, Swaziland, and maybe even up into St. Lucia. There's a lot of bird life up there, and I really would love to try and get up there and do some, some uh, birding up there as well. So I'm just going to see if there's any, any uh, me uh, messages and any questions coming in. Um, so I'm just going to have a read of those as well. Uh, just a question coming in from Lassie in Sweden um, and talking about how cold it is in the mornings and what temperature it is in the morning. I, I'd actually I keep meaning to buy a thermometer so I can find out for sure how cold it is. Um, it's not going to get as cold as it did in Entebbeni. I remember doing a game drive and it was minus four on drive and believe me, that is not fun. And the animals don't come out to play in that type of temperature either. And uh, I was driving along, and all my guests are wrapped up in their blankets. So they, they sort of wrapped up like this. Can't see their faces. So there's me in my hat and my gloves, and, and the bitter, bitter cold air is actually biting through my gloves onto my fingers. So I'm trying to sit on one hand and drive on my other and then change over, and, oh, it was not fun. And uh, the, the air felt like little knives um, flying into your face. It's, it got very, very cold, and we even had frost on the ground. Um, but as I say, that was up in Entebbeni. I don't think it's going to get as cold down here. Um, the, the average winter temperatures are somewhere between 12 and 20, apparently. So it shouldn't get as cold. But uh, as I say, I, I tend to feel the cold quite a lot. And especially in the mountains where we were uh, putting the collar on Lucky, it got very, very cold. I think I had um, about six layers on that night and I was only just warm. Um, I managed to buy myself a, a new jacket while I was there as well. So, <laughs> so I had a windbreak with a fleece on inside, so I had that one on as well. So I was wrapped up quite nice and warm. But 
it, it can get fairly chilly in the morning. And especially you'll notice as we go out on drives, um, as we go into winter, you'll see that there will be a lot more animals uh, sitting on the roads and the roads will hold quite a lot of heat especially that sand so you'll get them sitting on the roads um, to just try and contain a lot more heat uh, even the lions will do it uh, wildebeest um, all sorts of animals uh, just try and keep warm while it's very very cold Okay, sorry, apparently I just blasted a few people's ears out. I do apologize for that. But um, I think we do put the, the sand levels up um, quite high for the, the Gowrie Dam, but I think it's possibly just the, the difference in levels for the, uh, the microphone. That's possibly why you have this huge jump uh, from the final control and the Gowrie microphone. So... Uh, for those of you who are asking who I am, so I did actually forget to, uh, to introduce myself earlier. So I'm Tara. I'm one of the presenters here. I've been with Safari TV and Wild Earth uh, just under two months now, I think it is. Um, I did six, six weeks, and then I've been on two weeks leave. Um, so I have just, just arrived back. Uh, this is my second day back at work. So uh, I'm very much enjoying being back. But um, as I say, it's it's still not sunk in exactly what I'm doing. Um, or uh, that no, that came out very wrong. It's just not really sunk in that I'm actually here and doing this now. Um, as I say, I went back to visit my friends in Enterbeni, and obviously filling them in on the great sightings, and I was making them extremely jealous um, with all the leopard sightings and the hyenas and the elephants and everything like that. And as I say, I'm still, I'm still kind of pinching myself. I still can't believe I'm, I'm really here doing this. So it's really awesome to, uh, to actually be a part of, of, wild, of wild Earth and Safari TV and, and what they're actually doing. And as I say, I think there's quite a few of you who are new to this whole concept. And I think when Graham and em Emily actually set this, this whole thing up, it started with Africam. Um, I forget which year it was now. I think uh, if someone can actually just remind me, that would be great. But it was really quite a, 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 a different um, way of doing things. And they actually did uh, the, these live webcams. And they apparently they're quite static cameras to begin with. And it updated every few minutes. And to actually have a static camera and now, now going into full-on video camera with... Um, with the sound and everything like that is, is truly amazing and I think um, you know the, the vision that Graham and Emily had was, was quite phenomenal and to actually have uh, this opportunity to share these wonderful things with you is really amazing and for everybody that can't get over here to Africa you can still share the experiences that we have and you can actually share them live and, and that is really what the beautiful thing is I mean you, you, go, you have the documentaries, but quite often if you look carefully at the documentaries, it's done over two or three years of filming to get what they need. And what they actually, um, what they actually do is, is paste, they, they write a storyboard and they paste the clips together um, to actually go along with the story. So sometimes you can get a clip of beautiful green grass and then next thing you know, the grass is dead and then it's back to beautiful green grass. And that's because of the, the clips that they needed uh, to go along with the story, to fit in with that. And it's, it's usually done very, very well, but if you're looking for it, you can actually see it. So you don't always see exactly what's going on at that time. So to, to actually be able to join us on the drives and find and try and find these animals and actually have it real time, you, you get to appreciate, obviously, first of all, how long it takes to make these documentaries, um, but also how long it takes that you have to sit there and watch the animal to get... The, the interesting behavior coming out. And sometimes you can sit there and the cat can be flat for an hour. But if you sit there long enough, sometimes that cat might just get up 
if there's something walking next to it, it might just um, jump up and grab it. So you actually get to have some amazing behavior just by sitting and watching. And, and to actually have this concept, I just think is, is an awesome, awesome idea. And, and unfortunately, I never actually got a chance to, to see it before. I only found out about it when, when I got called about the, the uh, possible job. So, um, yeah, it really was just an awesome concept. And I'm really glad to see that a lot of people um, are still enjoying seeing the animals. And, and again, as a guide, um, what's really nice is being able to follow these animals and through their lives and to actually learn about them. They, they, they're characters, if you like, um, or even, you know, even friends. And you actually get to, to follow them and you get to see the children growing up and you get to see the, 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 the children develop and you get to see them develop and, and interact with other, other animals and things like that. And, and it, for a guide as well, as I say, it, it really is quite a special thing. And when you get guests coming through, sometimes you kind of feel a bit sorry for them because they only see a little little snippet. And if you only see maybe half a tail of an animal disappearing into the bush, um, and that might all that, that might be all that they see um, of maybe the leopard, and you feel really sort of uh, bad if you can't get that animal again and, and try and get them a nice view of the animal. Because uh, you know that you, you're probably going to see it maybe two or three days down the line, but for these people, uh, that that's their one chance to actually see this animal and to see it live and to actually observe it. Um, and as I say, sometimes I, I actually feel it's, it's such a shame that people can't uh, share our experiences. And obviously with this, it, it's very different. You can actually share that experience and actually follow uh, what these animals do. And I really, I really think it's an awesome idea. But um, <laughs> say some of you are actually saying you're envious, and it. And what was really nice is I was very excited to come back uh, to work, which not many pe many people can say that you're excited to go back to work. So again, it is so much a privilege to actually be here and, and doing this. Um, and, I, and as I say, having you guys along with us as well. So uh, and I'm very much aware that I've got a very nice job here and a. And, uh, and and to enjoy it as well as much as as I do, I'm just oh, I'm just in my element. I think someone said on my Facebook page, and I think you're very very true. It's very very true. <laughs> so I'm just seeing if there's any more questions coming through. Um. <laughs> and that's also if someone's just saying about having uh <coughs> having the ground between your toes very much so um i have kind of picked up mark's habit of walking around with nothing on my feet i'm still very much uh, a guide when i go out <coughs> on drive i still like to to obviously look the part uh, and make sure i have my boots and and ready to uh, ready for any action uh, in case there is anything i need to move away from or or anything like that. I, I just feel I, I need to have my, my boots on and my uniform. Um, but as I say, when I'm around camp, I, I do sort of walk barefooted. And I definitely agree with Mark. You definitely do feel a lot more a part of the bush. Um, but as I say, it's still it's still the uh, the guide in me still likes to have the the comfort of my boots when I'm when I'm out on drive. <clears throat> I'm glad to hear that you guys have enjoyed listening about my my adventures. And uh, as I say, this is uh, definitely one of the uh, the highlights of being here is, and then going on leave was for the Ingray Leopard Project. But uh, as I say, definitely a lot of rest that was needed as well. But uh, I still was getting up fairly early on some of the days. I wasn't being too lazy. <laughs> How else? Okay, uh, just uh, KB7. Sorry, it's taken me a while to get to you. Um, you're just asking whereabouts in the, in the Nevada desert does uh, the trapper Darren Simpson live? I'm not entirely sure. He didn't say, but um, I know he did say he doesn't spend a lot of time there. 
because uh, he's moving around the, the country quite a lot. And I think he is planning on going back to uh, South America to do some more trapping of the leper of the jaguars again. Um, so I know he's still with the Ingwe Leopard Project at the moment. Um, I think they've got. Uh, I think I think they were wanting to try and catch another male leopard because there was two very big male leopards in the area, and Lucky was one of them. And there's another one as well. So I think he might be staying on a few more weeks to to try and trap another leopard. Um, and again, as I said earlier, if you've if you've got uh, two males and two females, then you, you should actually get quite a nice. Uh, overview of what the, the leopards are doing in that area and again it will help to keep those leopards very safe in that area because they'll be able to, to see exactly what's going on um, and I think they did the same with the jaguar as well but what they, were, what they did um, was that they had their collar um, that they used actually stored the data so it was quite imperative for them to get the collar back and unfortunately the, the female that they I think she was called Elvira um, they, they actually put this collar on her a year a year ago um, and they were trying to get this collar back again and unfortunately they couldn't find her um, and they, they couldn't get a signal from the collar either so they I don't think they ever retrieved the collar so a year's worth of data they couldn't get back so that's why the satellite collars that the Ingrid Leopard Project are using it is actually quite um, quite a good uh, collar because as I say it downloads every six hours and it will download onto a map to show where that leopard's been. So sorry I couldn't be more help. I'll, I'll see if I can um, get a message to Darren because where, where they are they don't get any internet and that was also quite a, an interesting one because the, the lodge it is completely carbon neutral, uh, so they have the solar panel for, for charging the batteries, but for the day, few days I was there, it was all cloud cover. It actually felt like England. Well, actually, it felt colder than England, but um, it was very, very cold, very overcast, so we didn't have any lights, um, so we had to use the little um, oil or the paraffin lamps, and as I say, we couldn't really use... Um, we, well, you couldn't really charge phones or, or laptops or anything like that. There was one charger, I think, that was kept in the garage on a battery pack, so you had to go and charge uh, a laptop for about four hours to get uh, maybe one hour's use out of it if you were lucky. So <laughs> that was quite an experience, I must admit. <laughs> And uh, just hi to everybody that's, uh, sorry, I just had a fly just fly in front of me. Hi to everybody who's just joining us and uh, hope you, you, you managed to catch some of my uh, comments on the Ingwe Leopard Project and my leave. And um, ain't talking, it's good to see you in the chat room as well. And uh, you're just asking or saying about if we can get the friends on Jigger and uh, do some guest drives. I think that really would be great. Um, I was trying to convince Anton, who was one of the guides at Paperbark, to come up and try and show us how. Uh, obviously, I've done a couple of fireside chats um, with the tracking. And what he does is actually make casts of the tracks. And so I was trying to get him to come up and show us how he makes a cast. So... Uh, you guys can also use it in whichever country you're living in and make a cast of, of any animal track that you find. So I'm definitely going to get try and get him to come up and show us how he does that and uh, hopefully see if we can find maybe Karula or one of the boys' tracks and actually cast the track there as well. That would be really fun. And uh, as I say, I've definitely started trying to uh, ask some of the guys that I know um, there's one guy who's um, he's very big on snakes, and I used to work with him at at Entebbeni, and uh, I've sort of been asking if he would be interested in coming down and and uh, maybe showing us a couple of snakes. Um, but as I say, that that one I think will be in uh, in the future. I'm not too sure if he's ready to do that now, but um, I'll definitely be trying to, to get him to come down to show us a few snakes because that's obviously one of the things that we don't really see too often and it would be quite nice to show you a puffada and maybe a cobra and that sort of thing um, obviously with, with keeping it 
um, in, in, you know, in, in uh, good conditions and, uh, and just showing you that snakes aren't really as bad as what everybody makes them out to be. Um, you know, a lot of people think that they're quite threatening and they're ready to bite at any moment and things like that. And it would be quite, I'm, I'm quite keen to show everybody that actually snakes are not like that at all. And uh, this guy is, is really, is really great at, uh, you know, showing showing the behaviour of the animals um, and of the snakes. And and uh, I don't know, for me, it's quite important. Oh, he's saying he actually had a puff out of while I was on on break. That was really good. I hope it was quite a big one, or was it sitting, not really doing much? Because they're quite lethargic snakes, and um, a lot of people are scared that if you stand on them, they're going to bite you. And uh, I was actually on a snake course, and the guy who was who was doing the presentation uh, sort of reenacted. Obviously, he didn't sort of put his whole foot on the snake, but he he basically um, sort of reenacted. And the snake, all it did was sort of puff up um, and hiss. And obviously, if your foot's anywhere near that, you're definitely going to be taking that foot away. Um, not quite understanding you, Nordstrom. Uh, do black mambas, leopards, and lions sometimes? Not fully understanding that one. <laughs> if you can, um, do you mean to show a black mamba or the tracks, or what was that? Oh, okay. <laughs> do black mambas bite leopards and lions sometimes? Um, again, it, it, I don't think that they would too often. I think it would be a very freak accident if it did happen, purely because black mambas um, would do, just like if there's a car driving by, um, they'll, they'll raise two-thirds of their body off the ground. And I think if there was a lion or a leopard in the area, um, the black mamba, if it felt threatened, would probably do this. And this would probably be enough to, to scare the leopard or the lion away. Um, you don't really hear of it or see it too often. Um, in fact, I don't think I have heard of a, any animals really coming into contact that badly with the black mamba, unless it's an animal that would eat um, would eat a black mamba, which I'm just trying to think of. Um, as I say, I think it's possibly the smaller black mambas might be eaten by eagles. Um, maybe even the, the banded mongoose might try a black mamba. Um, I know they go for cobras. Uh, maybe even the honey badger might go for a smaller black mamba, but especially the, the two or three meters, I think um, there'll be quite a, a difficult snake to try and get hold of, um, especially for those smaller smaller creatures. But I think, if anything, I think the, the honey badger would probably be the one that would go for a black mamba out of all of them. Uh, the honey badger being quite uh, an aggressive little little character and uh, a lot of animals give it quite a wide berth. Um, as I say, I, there was a, a really very funny story. I think it was from Predator World and they had a, a, a honey badger and it managed to escape its enclosure and they, they, when they came through the next morning they knew exactly where it was because all six lions uh, in the neighbouring enclosure were up a tree and this honey badger was running around or just walking around strutting his stuff at the base of these trees so the lions were scared enough to actually go and sit themselves in a tree uh, away from this honey badger and the honey badger is not that big um, I'm sure everybody uh, knows what a, a normal badger looks like, a Eurasian badger. They're a little bit smaller, um, but they, they have a silver back or a white back and a black body. Um, but as I say, they're able to turn in their skin. So if you grab them by the scruff of the neck, they're able to actually turn around and bite you. Um, very, very fierce, yeah. Um, I think one of the words that's used is tenacious. Um, and as I say, they, they're quite an amazing little creature. And... Uh, they, they really will just go for it, um, and I've I've heard of them sort of climbing up into people's cars and things like that. If they, I'm not too sure what the reasoning behind it was, but they obviously felt threatened or something, and as I say, it climbed up into the the car, and that was one of my friends up in Mudique that told me that. Um, so I'm not too sure why it did that, but um, yeah, again, very interesting little character, and and quite amazing if they get bitten by a snake. It's it's almost they could be on death's door and you, you think they are going to die and then the next day they just come around. It's almost as if they've woken up from a, a just a bad sleep or something. It's it's quite amazing the ability of these creatures to to work out the venom from from their system. 
Um, so that's why I'd say that was probably the one that would go for a black mamba if, if there was anything. Um, any, any large black mambas, maybe the smaller ones, as I say, the smaller creatures that eat snakes might, might go and eat, but as I say, it's, it's quite a... Unless you see it, I think it's one of those, you, you won't believe it until you see it. Um, so yeah, maybe one day we might be lucky. Now that's something I'd love to see as a wolverine. Um, I have, I've seen one once in captivity. Uh, it, was, it was quite a lot smaller than I thought they were going to be. Um, obviously around the, the US, uh, I think they probably, in the forests of, of America, I'm sure someone will be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I'd definitely love to see a wolverine. An Alaska woman, you said you've seen them here, uh, there in Alaska as well. That's quite incredible. Alrighty, well, I think if there's... Oh, there's another question coming in. Are there any black leopards? Um, now, black leopards, as Bagheera in the movie Jungle Book, they do exist, and that's from Lassie in Sweden. Um, and they, yeah, as I say, they do exist. It's just a melanistic form, so it, it's a recessive gene that just causes too much melanin or pigmentation um, in the animal, and it just turns the animal black where it should be yellow. And, and if you look very, very closely at, at uh, the, the black leopards, otherwise known as panthers, um, you'll actually see the, the dark circles. So you can still see the rosettes if you look very, very closely. Um, and again, a jaguar as well is also a panther. And again, you can get melanistic form of the jaguar as well. So um, you do, you, they, they do occur, obviously not very often. There was a rumor that there is a black leopard in, in Leidenberg. Um, we were hoping to, to, to glimpse it but um, I don't know if they've caught it on camera yet. I don't think they have. Um, but there's, I think there's one person that keeps seeing it, um, and they seem to know what they're talking about. So I don't, I don't think it's him uh, just saying it for the sake of saying it, um, but I think they have yet to get it on camera. So it'd be quite, it would be quite nice to, to, to get one on camera there, and I'm sure uh, the Ingwed Leopard Project, if they do get the, the picture of that, they'll put it up on their, on their homepage. Uh, so if you, if anybody is interested in what the Ingwe Leopard Project do, they do have, they do have a homepage. Um, so if you would like to become a fan of that as well, I'm sure it's possible, and you'll be able to keep an update on what's going on with Lucky and and the girls. Um, and as I say, if they do find a black leopard, I'm sure they would put a picture up there. But I think it's time for me to to say goodbye. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me waffle on again. But I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. And as I say, uh, it really was just amazing to, to have that experience. And again, I'm, I'm glad I'm able to share that with, with you all. And, and it's great that you're actually interested in, in obviously, everything outside of, of what happens here at Safari TV. Because um, obviously, it's a great wide world out there. And it's, it's great to actually understand other projects and, and other animals from across the world, and so it's quite interesting about the wolves. I never, I never realised that there is uh, a compensation for the wolves, and also for Kenya as well. So it really is great to to hear about those projects as well. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, I hope you're going to join us tomorrow for the drive. I'll just check, see who is on drive for you. I think it's. Uh, I think it's going to be Jao, but I'll just quickly check for you, so do bear with me. It's just taking a little bit of time to, to load. And we are going to be on Friday. So we have... <coughs> oh, sorry, it's, it's Patrick. Patrick's presenting tomorrow morning. And Caroline's going to be on camera, and Catherine on final control. So do join us tomorrow, and... Uh, Maybe we'll hear the lines tonight, so keep definitely keep a listen out. I think someone also thought that they heard a leopard this morning uh, doing his soaring, so keep a listen out for the, the leopard around the dam tonight. You never know, you might be lucky. 
and I shall see you again on Saturday morning when I'm presenting Saturday morning. So otherwise, do take care. Thanks for the chat, and I'll see you again.